Good evening. Welcome, uh, everyone. My name is Alfredo Saad Filho. I'll be chairing this um, session. This is a Development Studies Department uh, seminar organized jointly with the uh, ESRC Bloomsbury Doctoral Training Center for the Social Sciences. We're very happy to welcome Tariq Ali uh, this evening to SOAS. Uh, and the structure of the session will be that uh, Tariq will speak for about 40 minutes, and then my colleague um, Faisi Ismail, uh, also from Development Studies at SOAS, will um, start the discussion um, on, this, um, on the topic of Tariq's um, presentation. We'll then open to questions uh, from uh, the floor. So everyone is uh, most welcome. Before we, before we start, let me just say a few things. One is uh, our next uh, seminar on uh, Tuesday the 23rd, so next Tuesday, is with Professor Gabriel Palma from the University of Cambridge. And the topic is, why is inequality so unequal around the world? And that is uh, next Tuesday at 5 p.m. in the main SOAS building in room G3. That's my notice number one. Notice number two is a Leverhulme lecture by Professor Georgos Kallis, um, who's a visiting professor at SOAS, uh, and he's normally based at the University of Barcelona. The topic of the lecture is limits without scarcity or why Malthus was wrong. And that lecture will be on Wednesday, Wednesday the 2nd of March, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, at the courtroom on the first floor of Senate House, uh, Senate House here in Mallet Street. Um, notice number three, um, not a, a kind of proper academic debate at all, is a play, a theater play. Some of you might have seen this leaflet. The play is called In the Night Time Before the Sun Rises by Nina Segal. And that play is at the, the uh, Gate Theater in Notting Hill. Um, the Department of Development Studies at SOAS has got a special relationship with the Gate Theater. We have this session on um, Wednesday, the 24th of February, 7.30 p.m. for SOAS. So SOAS uh, staff and students are welcome to book uh, a special ticket for this um, play. Um, it's the world premiere of this um, special uh, event. Okay, that was my um, series of announcements. Also, very, very seriously, this is, uh, you might have heard of the uh, police attack at the campus of uh, Nehru University in New Delhi. And there's a petition that is available on change.org uh, and the title of the petition is say, say no to police action in JNU and all universities. And the gist is that the police has invaded the campus. The president of the JNU Students' Union has been arrested. The petition is to demand the release of the um, president of the Students' Union, to stop the arrests of students, to withdraw police from our campus, university campuses in India, and to resist against the higher education uh, policies of the BJP government. So you may add your name to this uh, petition. <laughs> now, um, I am absolutely delighted, thrilled to welcome Tariq Ali uh, to SOAS once again. Tariq has been to SOAS several times before, but of course this is the most special uh, event of all. Tariq will be discussing his newest book, uh, The Extreme Center, A Warning. The book is available uh, outside in a store that is uh, being run by the Sri Lankan society. All proceeds uh, of sales tonight will go to refugee-related uh, uh, charities. And Tariq has very, very kindly um, agreed to sign copies of the books uh, after this um, session. Now, Tariq will speak on um, the book. The title of the talk tonight is The Extreme Center, How the Neoliberal Project Has Shaped the World. Tariq Ali needs no uh, introduction. I'm not going to spend time on this. Tariq has been a leading figure of the British and the international left for many, many uh, years. Well, we are all familiar with his uh, 
intellectual, his academic uh, interventions, his contribution to the New Left Review, his contributions to uh, a number of uh, pieces in writing, to cinema, uh, to broadcasting, the London Review of Books, The Guardian, uh, and so on. He's an absolutely towering figure of the British left, were more than happy, extremely ecstatic, Super thrilled to have Tarek Ali with us uh, tonight for a session that will be absolutely wonderful. So uh, welcome, Tarek, and thank you so much for coming to SAR. Dear friends, uh, SOAS students, others, very glad to be here to discuss this theme with you because this is something which is not only relevant but is being posed in different parts of the world. This is not something restricted to Europe. It's something which exists in many parts of Asia, in many parts of Africa. And we can summarize it as follows. That Within the given framework of capitalism as it exists today, all political parties in power or who wish to come to power within that framework have basically to do, carry, uh, agree to carry through the same policies. This is the political side of neoliberalism. The economic side we know well. It has existed now since the 90s of the last century. But a more critical uh, view has emerged, especially after the Wall Street crash of 2008. Because this crash revealed how vulnerable the economic system was and how the financialization of capitalism this applies largely to the Western world, but not exclusively, that the existence of this peculiar form of capitalism based largely on finance, the movement of money, speculation at a very high level, huge amounts of money there to be made, and at the same time, coupled with an attack on the welfare state, an attack on all the aspects of life that had been agreed after the Second World War, the breach of that consensus, the entry of privatizations in the shape of private capital in the most hallowed domains of social provision. This is something to varying degrees that we have witnessed in this country and, of course, in other parts of Europe. And so the, the issues raised by it are quite similar. Till the crash of 2008, anyone who challenged or questioned the efficiency or the longevity of the system was constantly attacked. And the attack used to come in very interesting forms. The attack used to come especially by saying that people who question this amazing new modernization process that we are witnessing are dinosaurs. And the dinosaurs were either conservatives who refused to accept the change that was necessary, or people like myself, socialists, radicals on the left, who felt that this system was not going to work, and in any case was never intended to work for the majority of the populations of Europe and elsewhere. So we were called dinosaurs, till I started pointing out to people who hurled that abuse at me that dinosaurs are, in fact, incredibly popular with young people. <laughs> that whole museums are constructed in virtually every major European country so that people can go and admire these dinosaurs. And so I said I'm not particularly insulted by being called a dinosaur, I'm happy to join that company, and now you're making Hollywood movies where dinosaurs are brought to life. <laughs> I said, you don't need to do with that with us, we're still around. <laughs> mm. So 
all this disappeared, or most of it disappeared, after the crash of 2008. Because nobody could now stand up on their two feet and say, capitalism is wonderful. It's working extremely well. The system didn't die because it never dies on its own. It needs pushes here and there. But it was severely dented. And what is extremely important is that was what was dented was not just the economy, but also the psychology and politics that justified this system. That is something that has to be understood. And slowly, gradually, in different parts of this continent, which I'll concentrate on today, new movements began to develop of one sort or another and challenges began to be mounted to the existing political parties. Now, my concept of the extreme center is very basic and very simple. It is this, that under the neoliberal system, since no economic diversity was to be permitted, the political side of it was that political diversity, too, was a thing of the past, from the age of the dinosaurs, when you could actually argue about politics. And that parties of the center, center left and center right, effectively carried through the same policies. Were there differences? Yes, sometimes on cultural issues. In this country, not even on that. And on who came to power and who exercised power and who made money. Because tied with this emergence of the extreme center in the political systems of Europe was the symbiosis, the linking together of big money and small time politics. And if you look at the scandals that have erupted, at the number of labor politicians, new labor politicians, who have ended up working for the private companies who they aided and helped when they were government ministers. It's quite astonishing, quite astonishing. And some of these government members, once upon a time, were even members of groups well to the left of the Labor Party. Take one case, Milburn. Alan Milburn, the health secretary, labor health secretary, working now as a senior consultant for those who wish to privatize the health service and constantly putting pressure on it. I remember him well in the 70s. He used to be employed by a bookshop in Newcastle called Days of Hope. And he was so busy smoking all the time, <laughs> the trade unionists who entered the shop said to him, Alan Ladd, we think you should name, change the name of this shop to Haze of Dope. <laughs> and guys like him, guys like him, who completely made a, a right turn, forgot everything they had believed in, <clears throat> and are now busy agitating, not so privately, for the private sector to enter the National Health Service and to destroy it, of course. Ultimately, that is the logic of everything that is being done to have a two-tier health service, one for the poor with minimum treatments and the others for which you have to pay. It's a trend all over <coughs> the uh, Western world, except curiously enough in the United States where they've had this system and now want to change it. And so Bernie Sanders is actually agitating for a health service of the sort that existed in Britain after 1945 and in the 50s, single payer. So these are some of the, the, the contradictions we see. And the fact that there has been a challenge to this extreme center is due largely 
to what happened in 2008 when people began to look elsewhere and to think seriously about what sort of alternatives were possible. Now, most of the alternatives that emerged, and here one has to be very frank, are all positive, and I support them. But how radical are they? And how radical should they be? Most of the alternatives that have emerged, to one degree or another, have been various forms of old-style social democracy. Social democracy, <coughs> in a very special way, in the Bolivarian republics of South America, because here social democratic measures, state intervention to build a strong health and educational sector, was accompanied by huge mass mobilizations of the poor. That was what made it very special. In Europe, we've had social movements of one sort or the other, which have led to the formation of new political currents, particularly in countries badly damaged by the crisis, uh, as were Greece and Spain. And these movements, one of them which came to power in Greece, Syriza, was so badly clobbered by the European Union and its institutions, the Troika, which said to it, you cannot even push through the minimalist demands that you have projected. Demands which really, if one is to be blunt, one has to say are, in Europe at any rate, are new, small, weak versions of social democracy. That is all they were demanding. If you look at Syriza's program, in the Thessaloniki program, they weren't demanding all that much, just saying, please don't privatize everything here. <laughs> and you know, we can't compete with the European banks if you're going to buy up everything in our country. Please don't attack our pensioners. We need help on that. No, because the European Union and its leaders saw this tiny challenge by Syriza as something which, if accepted, might spread to other parts of Europe, might be seen as an example, and more radical demands might actually erupt in other parts of Europe if we concede even a little in Greece. So they didn't. And they saw Greece in a curious way as a weak link and smashed it. And the leadership of Syriza capitulated completely, shamelessly, and said, there's nothing we can do. Of course, the story isn't over. Just uh, a few weeks ago, there was a general strike. 100,000 pensioners marched, the usual clashes between demonstrators and police, and Syriza behaving like previous governments had done before it. Now. The, 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 the support that Syriza had obtained from so many and then was not even able to push through these demands has got people thinking again. How are we to get where we want to get? And it's not easy. Then we had the emergence of a huge movement of occupations, of town squares, of cities, of sectors, uh, poor sectors in Spain, all over Spain. This movement evolved into Podemos, a large Spanish radical party, which has come up very quickly and is now vying for governmental power in Spain and could, I mean, it, it's more or less the same as the same vote as the Spanish PSOE, the Social Democrats, the new labor of Spain, and um, it could even overtake them. But if you look at its program, which is not unimportant, the program is what I say, a little bit of social democracy. 
which we can all support. I don't think any progressive person would say, no, we won't support that because it's not radical enough. One has to support all this, but at the same time be very clear that, yes, it isn't radical enough. And on its own is not going to deliver for too long. That is what we face. We need movements and parties which can go beyond that even. But people learn at their own pace. Parties are formed in their own context. Look at this country. I mean, nobody but nobody would have thought on the right, left, center, anywhere that Jeremy Corbyn could become leader of the British Labour Party. He certainly didn't. <laughs> I'm not joking. He didn't. We didn't. And yet it happened. And the only reason it happened <clears throat> is because tens of thousands of people, young and old, fed up with the lack of a choice, decided to use a loophole offered by the Labour Party, thinking it would actually help the right inside the party, and took it. And, you know, gave Jeremy Corbyn a huge majority as leader of the Labour Party, he got almost, I think, almost more votes than all the other uh, candidates put together. So he started off as a joke candidate for some, and at the end of the campaign, it was obvious who the joke candidates were. <laughs> the ones backed solidly by the bulk, not just the bulk, by every single grouping within the English media. Everyone backed them. They failed. And Corbyn won. And Corbyn's victory really brought English politics back to life again. I say English because Scottish politics had already been lit by the campaign for the referendum, the independence campaign. I mean, I was there several times during that campaign. It's unbelievable to see the rapidity with which people were politicized, discussing with each other, school students allowed to vote at the age of 16 for the first time, different arguments for, for independence, against independence, and it went on and on and on. And it had a huge impact on people in Scotland. And in my opinion, it also had a huge impact on people in England. And the young people who came out for Corbyn were not blind to what had taken place in Scotland some months ago or some years ago. And so <clears throat> the Scottish movement resulted in a huge shift. Many thought that after the defeat of the referendum, that would be it now for another five years, but it wasn't it. I remember going up 10 days after the defeat of the independence side, and there were two meetings taking place, one of the radical independence campaign, and there were 3,000 people at that, and Scotland is a small country. And there was another meeting organized by the SNP, the Scottish Nationalists, and that had 12,000 people at it. And just observing this, one knew that this was not going to go away. And they took Scotland in the 2015 elections in the United Kingdom. They effectively took Scotland, the SNP. So a bulk of the Scottish working class shifted its allegiances. Labour's hegemony in Scotland completely destroyed because the Scottish Labour Party was a parody even of the Blairites at Westminster. Destroyed, gone. And nobody thought that that process would repeat itself in this country <clears throat> so quickly. But it did. And so we have Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. I've argued that he is the most left-wing leader the Labour Party has ever had. 
not just on domestic issues, but importantly on issues of foreign policy, where most of his predecessors, possibly with the exception of Lansbury, uh, have been quite traditional conformist in terms of foreign policy, supporting the British Empire, uh, supporting the British state, not challenging anything. Here we have a challenge, and they they're taking it very seriously. Realizing that Corbyn's anti-austerity politics are popular with ordinary people, they've now switched to attacking him on the issue on which they really are worried, Trident. And should we be wasting money having these nuclear missiles stationed here just for show? Even Blair in his appalling memoirs, <laughs> wrote that as far as Trident was concerned, he said, I can see all the arguments against it. It's a waste of money, and it's not practical. He said this is true. But it allows us to upgrade and be seen as a world power. Well, it doesn't, actually. I mean, that is not the case. No one sees Britain as a world power at all. <laughs> Not even the British Foreign Office. <laughs> they know perfectly well what is going on and how things function. And everyone knows, everyone within the establishment knows that however many Trident missiles you have, you can never use them unless the Pentagon green lights it. I mean, nothing can happen without the United States giving their approval. So why bother with them at all? I mean, no one's going to wage a nuclear war on Britain, or if some idiot does, the United States will defend Britain. I mean, there's no doubt about that. So even if you accept the sort of most absurd side of that argument, but they don't like the fact that this has become a big political issue again, and they don't like the fact that Corbyn opposed sending in bomber jets to uh, bomb Syria. And so all attempts are being made to try and get rid of him before 2020. And whether it happens or not depends a great deal on how many people mobilize. Because if you depend, or if he depends exclusively on forces inside the parliamentary Labour Party, he's lost. The question is how to use the 200,000 new members who've joined Labour and turn them outwards to win over other people. That is how it will be done, and it can be done. I, I'm very confident about that. But the tactics have to be very clear, that the tactics which got Corbyn le elected leader of the Labour Party have to be multiplied, improved qualitatively, and it's not impossible that there can be victory in 2020 if, if the powers that be let it happen. So it's interesting that the crisis of 2008 finally worked itself up in England inside and through the Labour Party. I must say I'd never thought that that was possible again. I thought the Labour Party really was dead. And I wasn't too upset either. <laughs> but I was wrong. One has to admit this. And one reason for this is that we've never succeeded in this part of the country in coming up and building something really solid to the left of the Labour Party like they have in other parts of the continent. And one reason for that is that the electoral system the first-past-the-post electoral system seriously distorts the democratic process and is designed precisely to prevent third parties from coming up and challenging, either from the right or the left, which is why so many of us have been arguing for a proportional system for so long in this country. So that is <clears throat> uh, what, what happened here. In the Irish elections, the Irish Labour Party, if the opinion polls are right, is probably going to be wiped out. They say it'll be left with two or three seats. 
because of its appalling role in implementing ruthlessly and shamelessly the policies imposed by the Troika and the European Union on Ireland. They were very proud of this, Irish Labour and the, their coalition partners, saying in Ireland people are happy to live within their means, well, like hell. And this whole concept of living within their means, who determines that? Who determines what the means are? The state, which they attack most of the time when we say that the state can be used to help the poor, this is attacked. But when the state is used to help the rich, without the state, who would have authorized the trillions used to bail out the banks in all the Western world after 2008? The state was used, taxpayers' money was used to do that. So in this situation, there is everything, in, in my opinion, to play for. One shouldn't be too despondent. Of course the situation is not good. But developments in different parts of Europe show that some change is beginning to take place. And move, new movements are emerging. A new generation is emerging here and in the United States of America, which wants something else. I mean, what is very interesting in the States is that the attempt by Hillary Clinton, for instance, to use a very crude form of identity politics has backfired very badly. When she found out in Iowa that the bulk of young people, including young women, voted for Bernie Sanders, they've changed their tactics. Prior to that, <clears throat> the Clinton gang uh, was saying that women who didn't, I mean, you, you remember, have you heard of a character called Madeleine Albright? <laughs> She's the one who once told CBS television that 50,000 500,000 children dying in Iraq because of Western-imposed sanctions was worth it. That's the one when she was Clinton's Secretary of State. And she's the one who said, there's a place in hell for every woman who just doesn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Well, she's been, she actually said that. To which I replied that there's a permanent place in hell reserved for NATO luminaries, including her. <laughs> so <clears throat> she's been forced to apologize in public in the New York Times for having said that because it pissed off so many young women. As if the identity of a person determined what he or she thinks on everything. Very dangerous to believe that, because it's never been the case. Never been the case. And it isn't the case. People can be Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, men, women, whatever. But they think differently, and they have their own ideas on different things. And they usually vote for or participate in activities on the basis of what they believe or think or which way they want to go. It is not the case that there is a single identity in each person that determines everything. This view has, by the way, often been encouraged in the last uh, 25 years, because this is not something that threatens anyone, uh, that threatens the state or any, anybody at all. Quite happy if you think like that. But people don't think like that. And interestingly enough, it's in the United States where this form of politics had proceeded <clears throat> beyond belief, a uh, form of identity politics, where it's now being challenged. And challenged in quite a dramatic fashion. So what I'm trying to say to you is that politics is beginning to emerge again. And that is something to be pleased about. Because for a long time, politics, political debate, political discussion, political alternatives had virtually disappeared. 
all were being discussed in sort of tiny circles. And now we have a situation in different parts of Europe where politics is being discussed again. The second or the third aspect of neoliberalism and the removal or weakening of social safety nets, the creation of a huge political vacuum at the center of politics because the parties of the extreme center essentially are no different. How many people have I heard say over the last 10 years, oh, I don't do anything in politics, they're all the same. What they meant, of course, was that all the mainstream parties were more or less the same, and that, of course, was true. But the creation of this huge vacuum in European politics has not always been taken advantage of by the left. We are seeing now also, and this is something we shouldn't forget, the growth, rapid growth of an extreme right. In France, the Le Pen party is doing extremely well in the uh, opinion polls. It's not going to win France, but it'll come pretty close to doing it. And the frightening thing is that various polls show that a majority of young people between the ages of 18 and 26, those who participate in politics in some shape or form, say that they are sympathetic to the National Front in France. Now, how do we explain this? We explain this by the fact that the Socialist Party is completely and totally bankrupt, and the groups to its left have failed to inspire anything in France. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. In Germany, which is a very careful country, and kept that way since the Second World War by NATO and the United States. We have the emergence of a party called uh, Alternative for Deutschland, a German alter party for a German alternative, which is on 10%. It's an openly <clears throat> racist party. And three weeks ago, its leader publicly said, we should put the German army on the borders, and when the refugees come, we shouldn't immediately kill them. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting that. But we should say, you can't come in, and if any, then try and come in, shoot to kill. So <clears throat> in Hungary, in Poland, we have extreme right-wing governments. We have a right-wing government recently elected in Croatia, where the Minister for Culture, I think just last week or 10 days ago, said that it would be illegal to celebrate the victories of the Yugoslav resistance against the Third Reich during the Second World War. Why? Because the Minister of Culture belongs to a political current, a political tendency which fought with the Germans in the Second World War, with the fascists, the Ustash. He is a Ustash man. And this goes without too much comment from the European Union leadership because they are more worried by the left or organized labor. <clears throat> or challenges to the system. So this form of politics, creating huge social and political vacuums in different parts of Europe, now being challenged by many, is also being challenged by the far right. And by the way, it's foolish to imagine that the only thing they agitate on is uh, Islam or attacking Muslims or promoting Islamophobia or attacking the refugees. That is taken for granted. But when you talk to them, the Dutch right wing or the French right on social issues, they attack the extreme center parties not unlike us saying you are wrecking everything that was created that benefited the poor and workers. Marine Le Pen has pledged, I just say this to you because it's worth thinking about, that if she is elected president, they said, what will you do? And she said, well, I will restore 
what uh, Sarkozy, the, what the conservatives and socialists in our country have destroyed is uh, employment for ordinary people, welfare for ordinary people, etc., etc., etc. So it's not just that they agitate on issues which are repugnant. They obviously do that too. The lowest common denominator. They also say other things because it's on the other things that largely they win over support. And so Europe is in a very critical situation, which is why I've been, I, I must confess this to you, because some of my friends get shocked, I'm certainly not going to vote for the European Union. I really cannot do it after what they've done to Greece, after what they've done to Ireland, after what they're threatening to Portugal. I'm for Europe. I consider myself solid internationalist. I am not for this style European Union, which is nothing more than a machine for financialized capitalism. I can't in all honesty vote for it. And I think the left should not remain silent on these issues. Because otherwise, once again, it's the right the UKIP or the conservative right, Eurosceptics and the conservative party, who dominate the debate as if we have nothing to say. We have a great deal to say about why this particular form of the European Union is undemocratic, why it's corrupt, why it has made things worse on several levels, especially for the smaller countries uh, uh, in Europe why it is now totally dominated by the large countries, in particular Germany, and their banks. So it's not a gold standard that we look at and admire. It is something that has to be challenged. And simply because the right are doing it doesn't mean that we shut up. Because one of the big problems is that the European Union typifies and exemplifies the extreme center which exists now in other European countries as well. So we're in a mess, but we are fighting back. New forces are emerging. I mean, the, the, the fact, I was very pleasantly surprised that a majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party voted against bombing Syria. That was a step forward. And this obsession with war, being seen to wage war, as absolutely essential part of your armory is pathetic. And why don't we insist then that these extreme center politicians who wage war and dislodge populations tell people, and it should be a quid pro quo, okay, if we are going to bomb a country, then let's take a million refugees from that country too. The Germans did it, even though they weren't involved in the war. Every time you make war, why are there refugees? You know, why, why does it happen? I mean, in parts of French Africa, in the Middle East, in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, in the Yemen, where wars are being waged and fought, people want to leave. And they do leave. And they come where they can, and where they're allowed to go. So you can't unlink the refugee from the wars that are taking place. It's part and parcel of the same process. Just as refugees, migrants fleeing parts of Africa over the last 25 years do so because of what the World Bank and the IMF did to the economies of their countries. They did not have any work. So the solution to many of these things, refugees, migrants, many of you who come from that part of the world, like I do, know people don't want to leave their homes. They're not looking for an opportunity. Oh, good, where can we get into? They only leave because there is no other solution. Either their economies have been wrecked or their countries have been destroyed. 
And that is why it's so important that we have thriving, active oppositions in different parts of uh, Europe and the world which challenge what is going on. Because if you do it consistently and if you build it up, it actually begins to work. Thank you. That's, um, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much, Tariq. Um, these seminars do not um, run themselves. We have a wonderful team of student volunteers uh, in development studies who run the seminar uh, for us and make sure that everything functions like clockwork. So thanks, every uh, thanks very much to every one of our, our volunteers uh, tonight. Um, If you, are, if you are younger than I am and smarter than I am, you, you tweet. And if you want to tweet about this uh, session, uh, you should use hashtag SOASDevStudies or hashtag ESRC. I don't tweet, so that's why I didn't announce this before. But hashtag SOASDevStudies, hashtag ESRC. Um, I will ask now my colleague, Faiz Ismail, to um, make some comments about the talk, and after that, I will give Tarek the opportunity to reply, and then I will open to questions. Uh, Faisi. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, Alfredo. And thanks, I'd like to add my thanks to Tarek um, for a refreshingly polemical and um, an eloquent talk. Um, just, to, just to say a few words about the book. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing resource because it tells an absolutely... Uh, essential history, uh, a contemporary history, but uh, also like uh, all important uh, political writing, it also serves to give us ideas um, about, in this case, uh, how we should deal with uh, the extreme center. And I think it, it, it sort of crystallizes a, a thought that many people have had um, and, and then develops an analysis from that. Um, which is that there's, there's been a kind of uh, a, a silent takeover, almost, of the mainstream in, in the last um, 30 years by an economic and, and, and social philosophy that is, that is profoundly anti-democratic and, um, and deeply regressive. Um, and in that sense, it's also, it's also a prophetic book. Um, I, think it's, I think it's testimony to the, to the volatility of the times that we live in um, that the situation has changed uh, in some ways quite dramatically, as, as, as Tarek has pointed out, since the book was written. But the book, in a sense, predicts these changes because the whole analysis of the extreme center um, you know, foreshadows the kind of, the, the, the kind of political break um, because it describes the radical extent to which um, the democratic deficit is, is at the heart of, of neoliberalism. So we are at this conjuncture, and it, and it raises... Uh, uh, you know, many questions, a whole new set of questions, questions and I want to focus um, very briefly, actually, on, on, on five questions. Um, the first is uh, about social democracy. So you describe uh, the hollowing out of, uh, of democracy and that we're in the twilight of uh, democracy um, in the book. And one of the things um, your argument implies is a distinction between, on the one hand, the hollowing out of, uh, of social democracy as, as an embodied phenomenon in uh, the social democratic political parties specifically. And on the other, um, not only its survival beneath the, the kind of radar uh, of social democratic ideas in people's heads, in popular consciousness, but now it's reinvention um, through, through Corbynism. So do you think, the question is, do you think that although neoliberalism has been an exceedingly successful project, whether it's the case that social democracy never really died, um, you know, that the ideas of welfareism and redistribution and state investment and so on have survived and remain in the consciousness of whole populations. And that's why, you know, the changes that we've, we, we've, we've the political changes <coughs> that we've seen um, are now sort of struggling to find organizational expression in a sense. So that's the first question. Um, and at the same time, so the second question is at the same time, 
it's remarkable that um, despite the very real and serious challenges facing the neoliberal project, um, as you say, no alternative seems to be emerging from, from but from the one percent as well. So, so you know, we know that Davos took place last month, and just before it, Oxfam put out this, you know, stunning, <laughs> devastating report on, on on inequality. We all know the headline: sixty-two people own half the world's um, wealth. Now. Although there was a uh, discussion about inequality at, at Davos and perhaps amongst the best of them, expressions of you know, fear and worry uh, or, or at least passing concern about the state of the world. Um, but in a sense, this 1% is also in big trouble. I mean, if we think about it for one second, that level of inequality is simply unsustainable. It's not just a slogan that austerity isn't working. I mean, there is a crisis and there's a gulf between uh, the rhetoric and the reality. You know, they, they say that, that, that uh, you know, austerity will see a return to growth, uh, but yet they're talking about another crisis. And as you point out in the book, there's, there's low productivity growth, uh, arguably, you know, limited innovation uh, now than there has been in the, in the preceding decade. So, as you say, there's a, there's a contradiction. Um, uh, and this is despite, of course, the, the shining success of neoliberalism, which has, which has managed to transfer wealth uh, from, from, on a gigantic scale from the poor to the rich um, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, in, in, in such a way, but, but, but this is unsustainable. unsustainable. So, so um, the question is, don't you think it's rather odd, perhaps, um, that there hasn't been a move towards some sort of neo-Keynesian solution uh, to the crisis coming from, coming from the 1%. Uh, there seems to be no discussion uh, of moving away from the extreme center. And if we think about how social democracy was won in the past, yes, it was partly from below, but it also came from the common sense of the establishment. You know, Friedman famously said, you know, we're all Keynesians now. Uh, you know, that as, as in the Keynesianism was a, was a strategy of saving, saving capitalism. Um, and if not, then it strikes me that the that the that the um, the establishment is on a kind of collision course with popular consciousness, um, and and uh, the 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 third question is 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 also about you, you raise um, uh, of course um, uh, Corbynism and in Britain it's perhaps um, ironic with with the, with the rise of Corbynism it's the prospect of a return to the social democratic project that's opened up the possibility of shaping. Uh, uh, an alternative, a real alternative uh, uh, of a new politics. And of course, this has consequences. Um, but then the, the question poses itself not, as you say, whether we should support this social democratic project, but how we should um, support it. What should our attitude to social democracy be um, in, in a way that doesn't limit us to what in historical terms is actually a very moderate program, as you were saying with, with, with Syriza and, and, and Podemos. Um, because obviously it's been, been tremendously ex inspiring, um, the experience of, of how the political landscape has changed so, so much in the, in the past six months, um, you know, actually having an alternative. Um, but of course we need to be clear that, that Corbynism uh, represents a, a popular aspiration, but it's finding its organizational expression in a party whose core remains committed to the neoliberal project. Um, so, so, so the question is around, you know, how do you think that contradiction between the PLP, the, the Parliamentary Labour Party, and its membership and growing sections of the population will pan out, will, will sort of that contradiction will play itself out because it's clearly a deadlock um, situation. And so what will, uh, shift that um, situation, um, and the, the the fourth question is 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 just about you. You describe all the all the tensions within the EU, and I just wanted to ask you about other challenges or vulnerabilities to, to, to neoliberalism on, a, on, a, on, a, on an international scale. So you talk about US imperialism, its reach and the, and the concentration of, of global power in, in, um, in Washington, but it seems to me they're not getting it all their own way. I mean, the crisis in Syria is not going their own way, but also um, the, the kind of the, the power, you know, Russia and China as, as other um, regional powers which are, which are proving themselves to be, um, to be, to be challenges. Um, and, and then just finally, um, the, the question of um, the neoliberal university. 
Um, so you, you, you talk quite a lot about students. You mentioned the student movement of 2010 uh, in this country, which was both against the fees, the, the tripling of the fees, but it was also about it was also against the marketization that we're seeing. You know, the the um, and 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 how to stop it. I mean, at SOAS, we uh, as I mentioned, we have the the the, um, the Justice for Cleaners campaign. We have we have all kinds of you know. Uh, manifestations of, of um, the neoliberal university. And part of the sort of ideological function of, of, of neoliberalism will be winning arguments and destroying opposition and, and, and shaping that kind of discourse. Um, and of course, there are growing fears um, around ideas, you know, the, the, in the past year, the Counterterrorism Act has now told us that, you know, we have to be uh, monitoring and, 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 and sort of monitoring people's religious views and, and political views, um, that, that public bodies uh, may, no, may no longer be able to support P BDS and so on. And as you say, the, 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 the JNU crackdown, you know, the JNU is, is, is a, is a left-wing um, university and, and, and they are being targeted. So it's not just in, in this country, but, but we're seeing it um, all over the world. So I suppose the question is, um, to what extent is that the marketization of education and the neoliberalization of it, a desire to control ideas within universities and, and to, to some extent shut down uh, ideas and dissent and debate uh, in the public sphere and even you know, in the, um, you know, around the, the, the sort of sphere of discussion. Thanks very much, Fraser. That's very uh, stimulating. Tarek, would you like to yes. uh, comment? Yes. Um, <clears throat> very important questions. Um, the first, social democracy. Well, it depends. Uh, it, social democracy in this country, its high point was, of course, the Attlee government after the Second World War, uh, which pushed through massive social reforms, nationalized a whole number of industries, including coal, iron, and steel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, various forms of this took place in different countries in Europe as well. And uh, so people, you know, the older generation, of course, has memories of this. At the same time, the same parties which were pushing through these reforms at home, were entering into the Cold War and uh, helping to create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, participating in colonial wars, uh, the French in particular, but uh, Britain too, till Wilson more or less ended the East of Suez and the last wars, uh, colonial wars, uh, uh, came to an end. Uh, but, so that, but the reformist side of social democracy, obviously the domestic side of it, stayed in people's minds and the health service in particular in this country had a huge impact. But at the same time, you have to understand that we now have generations that have grown up since the 80s and have known nothing else but different forms of Thatcherism, i.e. neoliberalism, uh, which encourage consumerism, celebrity worship, individualism of various sorts, and this has been very strong. I mean, Corbyn says, he, he talks about it sometimes, that, you know, when he, during the election campaign, when he was getting larger and larger crowds, and he would say in a meeting, and, you know, we're going to revert to a situation where students will not have to pay tuition fees as they never did in the past, and he says lots of young people come up to him and say, God, was there a time when students were paying, <laughs> didn't have to pay tuition fees? And so I'm saying the memory is differential for different layers, different generations. Some of it, of course, uh, exists, but some of it uh, uh, doesn't exist. And of course, it was labor, new labor, that imposed tuition fees. It wasn't the Tories. And had there been a huge student protest against new labor when they did it, we might have been in a better situation to fight the conservative measures later on. But to my memory, there was hardly any resistance from the universities because it was Labour who was doing it. 
and I'll tell you a story that Ken Livingston told me. He said he was then a member of parliament in the first few days after Blair and Brown came to power in 97. One of the first things they did was to introduce tuition fees, by the way. And Ken describes, he says, I ran into John Major, the former, the last conservative prime minister in the corridors of the House of Commons, and we'd been councillors together in Lambeth years ago, and he said, come here, Ken, I want to ask you something. And Livingston said, what? He said, what the hell is going on with your people? <laughs> he said, every year I was prime minister, some idiot from the treasury would come to me every September and say, you know, Prime Minister, if we impose tuition fees on students, this is how much that the, we could put in the exchequer. And Major said, every year I would say, I'm not going to do it because my parents could never afford to send me to, you, to a university. And I know there are many, many other people like that and I will not have students burdened in this fashion. And he said, I'd crumple it up and throw it in the dustbin. This is what he's telling Ken Livingston. And he says, your people come in, and the minute the Treasury comes, they say, yeah, what a good idea. I'm, I'm saying this precisely to show you that right from the beginning, the new Labour project was marred and tainted by accepting policies of this sort. So, but of course, you're right. The memory of the health service is strong. Uh, particularly strong in this country, though, uh, you know, and I think there, let's hope there will be a resistance, but they're doing the privatization and the entry of the private sector into the health service quite cleverly. So you can't have a big shock immediately. It's being done slowly, but uh, impact it will have, and of course it should be resisted. The second question you posed on alternatives. It is true Let's talk about our own, you know, on the left first. It's not that there are no alternatives, it's that we haven't yet managed to come up with a plan that is both, um, how to put this, a program uh, that is both feasible and acceptable to la for large numbers of people in this country. This is the challenge, by the way, that faces us. And in Spain, what they've come up with is a total defense of uh, you know, the welfare state and saying that this should be put in the Constitution so that no government can ever privatize these things. Not a bad idea, but again, it stops. You know, it doesn't uh, go further. And, and I think the question is this, that all these things, you know, the, the challenging the private sector's ability eh, to run these things properly. And secondly, demanding that there is an audit of what a mess there has been since most of these industries were privatized, with the probable exception of the communications industry. Everywhere else has been a mess. The railways, particularly in this country. So... That will have to be an essential part of the program, but a program to be successful, in my opinion, has to be redistributive. And the question of property has to be raised as well, which hasn't done, which hasn't been done, and which is linked to uh, uh, what you were saying about the you know, what is characterized as the 1%, but it's probably a much larger social layer than simply 1%. If it were technically only 1%, we'd be laughing. It's not automatic that the 99% is unified. A large chunk of the 99% still has faith and belief in the system. It's breaking, but it's not breaking uh, that quickly. And it's this ideological dominance and hegemony that capitalism and its state enjoys uh, that has enabled it to go on for such a long time. Even, you know, there's... Uh, 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 Lenin once said, do you remember, have you heard of Lenin? <laughs> uh, Lenin once said that there can be no 
permanent crisis of capitalism, final crisis of capitalism, unless there is an alternative available and clearly visible to the masses. He's right. He was absolutely right about that. And you see it now in situations of uh, crisis. And so the different groups in South America, in Europe, in tiny parts of Asia who are struggling, are struggling for something, but they themselves are not quite sure what. No one, none of these movements, either in South America or in Europe, have said we want to get rid of the capitalist system per se. They haven't done it. And for good reason. They're still thinking about the defeats inflicted on what was once known as socialism and what went wrong. And the effect and the impact of that defeat is still strong, but many, many new ideas are coming up and being discussed. But till a political and economic alternative is found, I think this will go on. The interesting question you ask is, why haven't our rulers come up with some system that can, neo-Keynesianism, as you put it? Well, they don't need to so far. They haven't felt the need to. Social democracy was, became a major force and was allowed to push through all these reforms largely as a result of the Russian Revolution. That's what made social democracy absolutely crucial in the eyes of the Western rulers. They needed something, and the choice was either fascism or social democracy. In some cases, they wanted both. I mean, you'll be shocked, but you can go and study in your libraries. If you look at the coverage that the German fascists got in the British press, in the interwar years, in the late 20s and throughout the 30s, it was quite astonishing. I mean, everyone knows or should know that Churchill was a great admirer of Mussolini. He actually said the importance the Mussolini's fascists have for us is they can bring thugs onto the streets who destroy the Bolshevists. We can't do that. We can't mobilize the masses. They can. He was right on that, of course. But not just Mussolini. As late as 1939, he allowed one of his books to be published, which were essays on various politicians and political leaders. And in a review of Mein Kampf, which he reviewed very favorably, Churchill wrote, this is 1939, this was reprinted, that were Britain to ever fall into the same situation as uh, Germany had, I hope we would find someone as steadfast as her Hitler. This is the English ruling class. Later they decided this was a big error and mistake and opted for social democratic reformism instead. But I would say that had there been no revolution in Russia, social democracy wouldn't have been permitted to, 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 to go that far. Um, I mean, and classical social democracy. I mean, if you look at the 1891 program of the German Social Democratic Party, the Erfurt program, it's a wonderful document, absolutely marvelous document, saying what needs to be done. This is 1891. Very good on class, very good on race, and very good on gender. Quite astonishing. I was looking at, it, looking at it the other day for some other talk I had to give. Quite amazing. Okay, quickly. Um, third, Labour Party, other similar events, our attitude. Our attitude, I think, regardless of everything else, has to be supportive. I mean, how can we not support Jeremy Corbyn? Me, for me, it's an, you know, of course one has to support him and push him and work with him and defend him against those who say he has no right to be there, uh, defend him against the uh, attacks being made on him by, you know, a hardcore Blairite wing of the Parliamentary Labour Party. You know, something which I think was allowed to pass by was when the chief of general staff, effectively the commander-in-chief of the British Army, 
was wheeled on to breakfast television with Andrew Marr purring away as usual. This time he had an actual general sitting next to him. Uh, and said that the, uh, there was great discontent amongst the, uh, within the army, I think he meant the officer corps to be fair, um, that Jeremy Corbyn had been elected leader and were he to be elected prime minister there would be not just discontent, he used the word mutiny. Now, the fact that this was just accepted is astonishing. It has never happened before publicly in English history, or in recent English history, certainly. I don't want to go back to the English Civil War. Uh, <clears throat> so, it just accepted most of the tabloids and right-wing press supporting it, a weak, pathetic editorial in The Guardian, as usual. <laughs> what? Nothing. And when a formal letter was written complaining to the Ministry of Defense, the reply they said was, well, you know, we had the shadow defense spokesman of the Labour Party, uh, one of the Eagle sisters, uh, on uh, in the studio, and she said she agreed with the general. So where do you stand? <laughs> no, I'm just saying this is the level of the crisis inside, the, you know, within and inside uh, the um, uh, Labour Party. And and to answer your question, it has to be resolved. It can't go on like this forever. It will have to be resolved one way or the other. I mean, you know, to put it at its crudest, uh, will the new model Labour Party entrants who came in uh, be brought into the action again to confront the PLP? And in what way? I don't know. I'm just raising these problems and questions because it will have to be done at some stage. They want to get rid of him before 2020 and well before 2020. Mandelson said, we're going to leave him there for the time being, but we will get rid of him when the time comes. Well, thank you very much. I thought Mandelson was so busy making money with Russian oligarchs that he wouldn't have time to think about the niceties of politics in the House of Commons. But anyway, um, 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 and Blair too has, has come up with similar remarks. So I assume I'm not, in, you know, privy to what discussions take place within the Corbyn circle, that they have some plan as to how they're going to uh, respond to this. Um, uh, the other questions I've dealt with, so I'll stop. You know, the EU, etc. We we agree on that. Thank you very much, Tarek. This is getting better and better. Okay, I will uh, open to questions from the floor. I will group questions, um, and I will ask um, everyone who is asking a question to be really brief, because we, are, we have a time limit, and I want to have as many participants as possible. Yes, please. We've got roaming microphones um, that will reach you. Um, should I start? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. It was really interesting. Uh, what really interests me is this idea of uh, reviving some form of forms of radicalism or to radicalize um, the existing political parties. So my question is, how do you think that more radical political parties can fit into the existing uh, institutional systems, especially in gaining uh, some sort of public support, because we know that uh, people usually fear what it's called as radical, and this is probably one of the reasons of this extreme center. And the second, the second question is, um, don't you think that this idea of creating some sort of radicalism has always also been uh, one of the reason of the emergence of uh, populist and demagogical parties, which are radical because they declare themselves as outside of the political system, so they are not right, they are not left, and they just basically uh, create their power on the frustration of the people. Thank you. Thank you, let's try and be brief. I'll have four, three or four questions, yes. Yeah. In order to have uh, some kind of Keynesian 
uh, solution to sustain capitalism for longer. Could you uh, speak into the mic? Sorry. Yeah, we will obviously need to have a, a rising in Ireland after the election next month. We'll need to have a couple of revolutions in Russia next year. And then we'll also need to have the solutions there when capitalism goes into crisis. And like in the shock doctrine, they don't wait to come up with a solution when the crisis happens. They have it there ready so that it's the obvious thing to go for. So what would seem to me is a very radical citizen's income, like in this country, £10,000 per person, 50% marginal tax rate for all individuals and all corporations. And if that's the solution on the table, then when there's a crisis of the banks, of the financial system, any day now, that will be the only thing to go for. We, they can't talk about giving taxpayers money to the banks. We just need to say, this is what's there on the table. This is what we have to go for. And there won't be any two ways about it. I'd like to hear what Tarek thinks about that. Thank you. Um, at the back there, two colleagues. Um, sorry, question on Europe. Um, I'm a bit concerned about, from my point of view, Europe was a way of stopping further wars, particularly, you know, what Where happened. Are you? Uh, uh, the European Union, I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, don't you feel that there's a, this danger in voting to, to leave Europe and the consequences of that in terms of future wars in Europe, basically? Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is with the development of this new center, who are the power brokers behind all of this that are dictating these policies and do you believe there's a role for shady corporations or individuals that exist to push these things? Thank you. One final question of this round at the back there. Thank you. Um, I'm a pensioner. I'm old enough to remember uh, 1962 and the Cuban crisis. And what I've been reading in various blogs and all the rest of it about the recent um, crisis again in capitalism is there's a clique of neoconservatives in Washington who have taken over. And my fear is that these people are crazy enough, uh, we can see it already in the proxy war in Syria, that uh, since Putin has put his foot down and said, this is the line, uh, America is no longer going to be a unipolar um, uh, dominant uh, uh, hegemonic uh, nation, and we're going to have a multipolar world. Do you see a possibility of a kind of 1962 again? Thank you. Um, Tariq, would you like to respond? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but the, you know, populism, you asked about, is become a hold-all word for attacking anything that is not the extreme center. So parties from the right are called populist, parties from the left are called populist, um, and it's, or you know, if you say something even as an individual, listening, oh, you're being populist. It's interesting how this word has come into thing. I mean, you know, it's a crazy way <clears throat> of discussing, but this is what the Economist, the Financial Times, and the, and the press in general has happened, and I don't think we should fall into the trap of just using the word uh, like that. I mean, there's a very clear divide between right and left still. It's true what you say, that some of the movements, uh, Podemos, for instance, in Spain, says we are neither left nor right. When I, Iglesias, their, their leader, uh, when he interviewed me in Madrid on his television show, he said, well, what do you think of Podemos? And I said, well, I told him what I thought. But I said, what I don't understand at all is this line you take, we're not on the left and not on the right, because the whole world knows you're on the left. Everyone in Spain knows you're on the left. These technicians filming our interview know you're on the left, so what's the point of denying it? And the technicians at this point all started laughing. Uh, so, uh, you know, he didn't reply but went on to the next question. It's a sort of attempt to show we are something new. If by left you mean we're not social democrats, we're not that discredited left, fine. Okay. But just to try and create this feeling, and then you know, the, the problem then arises that other parties, the Ciudadanos in Spain, say similar things, we are, and we are not left, we are not right. They are very much on the right, and they were spawned by the Pepe. 
So it's not a useful uh, um, uh, a th a thing that they do. But how as to how more radical parties will arise, you know, will vary from country to country. There is no magic formula. That is one lesson we have learned or should have learned from the debacle of the left in the late 90s that there is no magic system where you say this is the exact form in which a new small mass party will come into being, leave alone a huge one. It will vary, it will vary, it will depend on the level of mass movements, the political traditions of the country, political consciousness in that country, how they want to uh, proceed. The key thing is that they have to understand that the one thing that cannot be ignored is politics. The political has to be reinserted into the life of citizens. I mean, that is, a, without that, you can't move um, uh, forward. Um, as to the friend who talked about the, uh, there will be another crisis, at, uh, yeah, well, there may well be, but you know, the thing is this, that you cannot simply erect something when there's a crisis. I mean, <clears throat> one of the forms of self-organization of the 20th century used to be the existence, the eruptions of workers' councils, of popular councils uh, in, in different parts of Europe. That particular tradition I haven't seen repeated in the 21st century when you have had huge mass mobilizations in Greece, in Spain, in the Middle Eastern countries, in Egypt, in Tunisia, the one thing they haven't led to is the cre creation of autonomous organs of power. It, it hasn't, you know, for a variety of reasons, which might be worth discussing at some other time. So it's not possible to do anything immediately. I mean, it's perfectly, it was perfectly possible, in my opinion, in Greece and in Egypt, uh, for people who had control of cities, single cities, to occupy the city as a whole and elect councils to run these cities. Perfectly possible, but it didn't happen. And one reason it didn't happen is precisely because people were not sure and not clear, not just ordinary people, but their political leadership of whatever it was, whether it was the Muslim Brotherhood or groups on the left or whatever. They didn't know which way uh, they were going to go. Um, is the crisis of 1962 a nuclear confrontation, our friend means? Uh, or the threat of a nuclear confrontation between the big powers going to repeat itself? I hope not. It would be bizarre if it did, because by and large, all these countries now, uh, even the ones who challenge the United States now and again and assert their sovereignty, are capitalists. And so, uh, are we going to see the emergence of inter-imperial contradictions with some of the countries armed with nukes? Possibly, but I rather doubt it. I think that one reason for the Russians' detachment from the United States is they are angry. They are angry at being ignored. They are angry that NATO is moving up to their borders. They said, why can't we be part of NATO? Why can't we be part of the European Union? We're a European country, to which there's no serious reply. So it's the, in my opinion, the Americans have been very provocative in Eastern Europe, to which the Russians have responded. I personally don't support either of them, but you know, that's not the point. The point is one has as a realist to see what's going on. I mean, what the hell was the point of encouraging the Ukraine or threatening the Ukraine or saying that it will become a member of NATO? What the hell is NATO anyway? It was meant to be a defensive organization. Now it looks like the armed wing of the neoliberal empire. It never f did anything throughout the Cold War. Never did anything. Now it's put into motion any time. You know, they're going to see if they can stop refugee ships coming to Greece now. NATO's been told. 
So, uh, and, and opposition to NATO is really confined to very small numbers of people. The big political parties, including the new movements that have emerged, don't challenge NATO or don't say we'll take our country out of NATO, which used to be the case. In Corbyn, I know from his political statements in the past, is very hostile to NATO. But some of these policies will be shelved. And that is a problem because it means that the uh, debate doesn't uh, continue. As um, for the EU stopping wars, look, <clears throat> the European wars that took place, the First and Second World Wars, the European Civil War, if you like, the causes of that war were very clear. In the case of the First World War, it was essentially a fight for colonies and empire. That is what the Germans said. That is what the British said. They covered it up, of course, that, you know, it's we are Democrats and the Germans are not, which also wasn't exactly true. The largest working class party that there was was the German Social Democratic Party with many, many deputies in the German Reichstag. They capitulated to the war, but that doesn't mean they weren't there. Far more powerful ideologically than the, than the, the British Labour Party, which had just been uh, formed not such a long time uh, ago. So that war was really a war for empire. And everyone used to accept this, except at the centenary commemorations where it's that we were better. You know, we really were in the right. I mean, even right-wing historians like Niall Ferguson, who says it's crazy to put all the blame on the Germans, was heckled at a, when he was doing a talk at the BBC. He gave a talk, which was actually not bad on the First World War. Uh, and he said, is there anyone in this audience who agrees with me? Not a single person put up their hand. He said, in desperation, he said, is there not a single Leninist here? He did say that. There wasn't. So it's, it's a very strange system where they know they are fighting again. They are sending people to make wars again. So previous wars are now being prettified and glorified. The Second World War, too, began, began as a war by the German imperial state. Uh, to try and create their European empire and then use that empire to try and take the world. I mean, Hitler, from that point of view, was a strong European. <clears throat> and most of Europe fell to him without fighting. Bulk of France with Hitler. The Scandinavian countries, only the Norwegians resisted. I mean, it's a sordid history, which we're not taught all that well uh, uh, these days. So I don't think that if there was, if the present style European Union didn't exist, the big danger would be of Britain and Germany going to war. Because the unifying factor today is not the European Union, but it's the United States of America both in terms of determining the type and pattern of economy, the institutions, the global institutions that run the economy, and, of course, militarily stronger than the whole of the European Union put together. So I don't think there's going to be a war between the European powers. And in any case, we fight for a different Europe, a better Europe, a Europe of the peoples, not a Europe of bankers. That's the point. Okay, thank I you. I think I've answered all of them. This is, this is brilliant. We have one more round of questions, and then we'll be wrapping up. Yes, uh, here. Uh, the microphone. Do we have a microphone for here? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask, how will the emergence of new technologies like robotics affect the labor movement? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one question right at the back. Uh, no, sorry. Um, oh, th that was a question. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, 
Is there any way that you would characterize an extreme center migration policy, both immigration and emigration, uh, in line with neoliberal orthodoxy? And would there be a shift with a victory by the extreme left? And what would it look like? Thank you. I didn't get that, sorry. Can you say that so again, where okay. are briefly? You? Oh, there at the back. Yeah. Uh, is there any way that you would characterize an extreme center migration policy, uh, both immigration and emigration, in line with neoliberal orthodoxy? And with a victory by the extreme left, could you see a shift in this policy and what would it look like? Thank you very much. A uh, question here. Hi, um, my question is um, um, about what you think should be the next steps for Spanish politics. Um, we're not at a point where there's lots of different packs being discussed and even the possibility of having uh, re-elections. And as a militant of Podemos, I'm curious of what you think should be uh, Iglesias' new, uh, next steps in, uh, for example, should he um, make concessions to parties like PSOE who do not represent the new parties of change and having been the uh, new, one of the new parties with, uh, one of the, with the strongest force, what do you think should they do in order to create a government? Thank you. Quick question. Uh, so you've spoken about the unifying factor in the world, or at least in Europe, uh, being the economy. And do you feel that these discourses of, <laughs> of needing to uh, maintain supremacy or influence or in any way power um, in what feels like a very aggressive world plays into nuclear weapons and how actually they only feed into the capitalist economy and that there is no real enemy, but this discourse is maintained in order to conceal the real uh, reach or reason for capitalism. I, I honestly didn't, could you just summarize your question yeah. in three sentences? Okay, <laughs> so do you think that the discourse of an invisible enemy is necessary for nuclear weapons to actually conceal how in reality there is no enemy and nuclear weapons and the nuclear okay. industry is actually very financially important. Thank you. Uh, question here. Hi. Um, just here. <laughs> um, two questions. The one question is you, you characterized yourself in the beginning as a dinosaur and you said you're rather proud of being a dinosaur. Um, then you were talking about Corbyn and Sanders who are also, well, not the youngest. I think Corbyn is 66 and Sanders is 74. Is that a coincidence or do we need dinosaurs? <laughs> Uh, the other question is, you, you said uh, you called yourself an internationalist and that you're actually all for Europe, but not for this Europe. Um, last week, I think, uh, Yanis Varoufakis presented his new movement, his Democracy in Europe Movement 25. Um, what is your position on that? Um, two more questions and super fast, and I'm sorry we can't hear from everyone because we're running out of time. Quick question here. Um, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm, I have a feeling you're a little bit hopeful about uh, what this rejuvenation of politics can achieve, using Syriza as an example, um, and their capitulation. So electing a, electing a government like Syriza has been the first short ticket of eliminating ma mass mobilizations to the policies imposed in Greece. So I wonder what you think of alternative forms to manifest discontent from the parliamentary um, option. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. Okay, I really can't remember most of these questions. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> How do we deal with the fact that the extreme centre has um, more or less captured the media both here in the UK, be it BBC, Sky, newspapers, etc., and also around the world? Thank you very much. Final question, yes. with apologies to everyone who will not be able to ask their questions. No, no, at, at the back, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm this ruthless. gentleman had I'm his really hand evil. up first, I'm actually. Sorry. Yes. All right, very quickly, I think that the neoliberal project, from, I'm old enough to remember, I think, watching uh, Margaret Thatcher win in 1979, and um, it came in on the back of, of, of them capturing the, uh, the Conservative Party. So surely any, any resistance and response needs to be done through the vehicle of capturing the Labour Party, if you like. It, it can't be done on the fringes. 
Um, that's one thing. And also briefly, you, you mentioned right wing, extreme right wing parties in Europe um, supporting um, socialist policies, previous socialist policies. Um, what explains that in Europe, but it, it, it doesn't happen with, with UKIP, for example, in, in, in Britain. And you know the old saying, if the left doesn't speak for the, for the working class, then the right, the right wing will. Um, so the, the, there's something that's a bit of a puzzle there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Super briefly, yeah. <laughs> I, I am not that evil. Uh, I just wanted to ask, when you were referring to the kind of old style uh, social democracy and how it was working fairly well after the Second World War, uh, do you think we're still in the world today the same kind of economic potential for the global community which is needed to implement that sort of social democracy? Tarek, about 18 questions uh, for you. Well, did you take them all down? No, I did not. <laughs> okay, um, on the question posed from the frontier about new technology. I think there's absolutely no doubt that this will have a huge impact on the question which I didn't discuss today because it's too long to discuss, but the whole question of work and what work is, what it was, what it means under the form of global capitalism uh, that we have today. The big shift from Fordism if you like, to smaller firms, the emergence of new technology. Of course, robots are part of that. They don't exist uh, on their own, and they have been used for decades now in countries like uh, Japan, the United States, uh, <clears throat> and even China, but even these robots, the, you know, have to be uh, controlled by human beings. Uh, so it, it reduces the need for huge workforces in advanced capitalism, but it doesn't do away with them altogether. They, they work on different levels, but of course it will, of course it will uh, uh, change things, and this is being discussed. And while on that theme, many people who write off the United States as a capitalist power and believe it's in total decline, et cetera, which some do. I don't agree with that. I think that, for instance, the most significant development that is transforming the 21st century on the level of technology took place on the West Coast, the, intervention, the, the invention of the internet. And the fact that that's where the big companies rose, often constituted by hippies from the 60s of one sort or another. I mean, I was staggered to find that there's a friend of mine who was a far left Marxist in the 70s, still is, by the way, and he said, oh, well, I was part of the original Apple team. So I said, well, why aren't you a, a billionaire helping fund the revolutions here, there, and everywhere else? And he said, they bought me out before they became really famous. So I said, okay. So it was, you know, a very interesting process that took place when these companies were formed. But one can't ignore the fact that they emerged in the United States. They didn't emerge in, in Europe or in Russia or in China or anywhere like that. Um, secondly, <clears throat> linked to China, the question you asked about China, I can't really do justice to that here. There's no doubt that the Chinese turn to capitalism has transformed that country and uh, done two things, created a growing middle class and created also a huge layer of proletarians, to use an old word. The Chinese working class today is the purely numerically the strongest and most powerful though it hasn't expressed itself politically as yet. So that story isn't over, but in terms of US-China relationships, if you look at what the Chinese produce, what Chinese industry does, it is essentially not at the top level. It is not producing the spare parts necessary, for instance, 
for the latest weapon technology, <coughs> or for the latest planes, or for the latest space excursions, or stuff like that. Most of companies like that producing those spare parts are based in Europe or America. Western Europe or North America, they've kept a grip on that. Many other things the Chinese, of course, dominate, you know, consumer durables. It's not possible to enter a shop without seeing something made in China. So from that point, the Chinese economy resembles, if you like, the big industrial revolution that shook England during the uh, uh, Victorian uh, uh, period. And they themselves are aware of that. They're very conscious. I mean, they invited a Cambridge historian to give a lecture to the think tank of the Chinese Politburo, an old friend of mine. And he said he suggested a subject. And they said, no, no, nonsense. We want you to give a talk on why there wasn't a revolution in Britain in the 19th century. So they, they are thinking, <laughs> they know. Uh, but they are way behind, and they don't want a big quarrel with the United States. They will defend their patch, and they will not allow any nonsense in China or its borders, but they are not interested in playing a huge role as an imperial power or anything like that, at least till now. Uh, and you know, if you study Chinese trade patterns in Africa or Asia, uh, that is what they do. They build a social infrastructure, trains, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to get them, uh, and they get on with the business of making money. That is how the accumulation of capital in China is taking place, and we can only speculate as to what impact it's going to have domestically and outside uh, in the years to come. Um, now, the questions asked about Spain uh, and, and the situation there, it's, um, it's an awful situation that despite the fact that the PP, the Spanish Conservatives, don't have an overall majority, Rao is still Prime Minister. And I think what is going on, if you want my opinion on that, is that the European Union and its bigwigs are trying like mad to persuade PSOE, the Spanish socialists, to form its extreme center government in Spain with the Pepe. The problem here is Rajoy. No one wants to work with him because he's totally discredited. So if you look at the Financial Times of the last two days, there are reports on how the Spanish judicial system, they went and raided Rajoy's office. They've got stuff, and I think they would like to discredit and finish him off or hope that by doing this he'll go away quietly. Then a new figure can emerge who can probably try and create an extreme government, extreme center government in Spain. Sanchez, the new leader of uh, PSOE uh, uh, in Spain, is not someone who is willing to participate in any government, but the uh, barons or the baronesses of the Socialist Party, especially the lady from Andalusia, I forget her name. Exactly. Uh, she's completely right-wing, very opposed to Sanchez, and she would happily go into a government with uh, Pepe if Rajoy was removed. So that is what is going on. And I think that uh, the maneuverings of Podemos around that I mean they are not stupid because they were trying to do what the Portuguese far left managed to do, but they got some guarantees. Pessoa is not going to give any guarantees to the Spanish left. None. They, it'll not be possible. So either they are going to break up or they are going to go into a government, which also means, in the medium term, political suicide. Uh, and then, of course, there's the whole question of Catalonia, which we don't have time to go into. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so that's Spain. As to the, the question asked whether it's accidental that Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders are representatives of my generation and not yours. Uh, it's not an accident, uh, but it's not particularly special either. I mean, it could have been someone else who'd done it, but uh, there are no young senators in the uh, 
wretched uh, American Democratic Party. <clears throat> and so Bernie was the only one left. And you know, for in the United States to describe yourself as a socialist does require some guts. I mean, if you look at the Republican debates and the people who turn up at these debates, you know, the sort of what the Chairman Mao used to call freaks and monsters <laughs> of one sort or another. And uh, uh, in that milieu, to say I'm a democratic socialist in itself <laughs> is quite brave. Uh, but I think another senator, he or she, uh, if they had done it, would have got just as much support. I mean, this young woman in Seattle who has won council elections twice as a socialist it just shows uh, uh, what is possible. And in, 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 in this country too, I mean, you know, the, the left of the Labour Party, the 10 or 12 people just held on and held on and held on, have all had their chances. Jeremy was lucky. He was lucky that, he, that there was growing anger in the country. And young people listening to his program said, this sounds great. I mean, they didn't come with any prejudices. They said, what he's saying sounds great. Let's go for it. Let's give it a try. Uh, and Jeremy also has a sort of quite a non-aggressive uh, personality. So the way he puts these ideas forward has had an impact on people, uh, not just uh, young people, but also many who'd left the Labour Party. But it also helps to create a new atmosphere and a new space in which many, many young people can function. So I hope it reproduces, if you like, in a new way, radical uh, uh, politicians in the best sense of the word. That is uh, um, what we need. As for the media and the extreme center, one, I didn't talk about that. You're absolutely right, and I should have. But one of the things that happened is with the emergence of the extreme center, you had the media, television networks, and newspapers, by and large, reflecting those views. So diversity went by the board. Whereas in, and also that there's another question, that whereas in the days of communism, the Western media took great pride in saying, we are not like you. You don't allow any other views except your own. We allow different views to take place. Uh, and uh, on our television screens, on our newspapers, but they don't need to do that anymore because that world has gone. So what are they proving? Nothing. So they've become like the people they used to criticize. I mean, if you look at the British or the American press, but very few exceptions, and The Guardian's really gone bad too, in my opinion, um, have very few views which contradict the mainstream and are sharp enough to, contra uh, to, to, to not to contradict, but to sort of take on mainstream opinions. And on television, it's exactly the same. The television news, whether you watch CNN, BBC World, BBC, ITV, uh, Channel 4 is marginally better. But by and large, it's the same agenda. It's exactly the same agenda. There's not a single news which has a different agenda and which starts the news with different items. It'll be the same items every day. This is this purely accidental? I don't think so. Um, I really have forgotten. Ah, the question about the, whether we should just have the parliamentary option. No, we should you know, have all possible options. But given what has happened in the last century, increasingly people feel that this is the best way to come to power. That, that might change if nothing much happens over the next 25 years in different parts of the world. It might change, but till now this has been a big backlash, if you like, against the 20th century. I mean, all the Latin American radicals came to power through parliament. Whereas in the 20s, in the last century, 
most of the guerrilla organizations who tried to mimic the Cubans and take part through armed struggle, creating small groups, failed, were killed, wiped out. A whole generation of very fine people were wiped out throughout South America simply because they tried to mimic the Cubans, thinking they could repeat the Cuban process without understanding the specific conditions that existed in their own country. Yeah, I've forgotten anything, I'm sure I have. But, um, Sorry, you, you've got you. While I'm thinking, what other questions there were? You slipped in yours. The what? <laughs> what did you say? How to rally around Corbyn? How to? Rally around Corbyn. How should we rally around Corbyn? Well, I mean, you know, <clears throat> one way actually is to participate in the campaigns, the anti-war campaigns, the campaign against austerity, the People's Assembly, Stop the War. All these things are there to be done. There's a meeting, I think, this Friday where I'm one of the speakers uh, preparing for the big campaign against Trident, uh, which is going to be at the um, Friends Meeting House from, I think, 6.30 to 9, to discuss how to launch the campaign outside Parliament on Trident to put pressure on the MPs inside, which was done very effectively on the Syrian war, by the way. So there are all these campaigns taking place, and then there's the group set up by Corbyn himself, uh, what's it called, uh, Momentum, um, which I haven't attended a meeting of, so I can't talk about it, but you know, which is, huh? Yeah, so uh, that's, <laughs> that's something, something uh, uh, to do. There are lots and lots of things which, um, uh, you should be involved in. Okay, that's your question. I, do, I think I've really tried to answer everything asked. If I haven't, forgive me. I will next time. Thank you so much.